Hello everyone uh, and welcome, welcome for joining our IRIS webinar on vehicle to grid solutions that we are implementing or are implemented in Utrecht. My name is Roel Massink and I will guide you through this webinar. Um, my name is Roel Massink and I'm the uh, international project manager of the IRIS project. Uh, I work for the municipality of Utrecht and um, yeah, I will try to guide you through this webinar. And if you have any questions uh, on this webinar, you can ask them in the chat box. Uh, I've also discussed with uh, Robin, who will give a, a longer presentation, that if you have any questions during his presentation, just feel free to put them in the chat box or open your mic and make yourself known, because then we can address the questions immediately. Uh, but for now, in this webinar, uh, we have uh, Robin Berg from uh, Lomboxnet. Uh, he is an IRIS partner and will share uh, his knowledge about the AC vehicle to grid solutions that have been developed and are being implemented in Utrecht. Um, on the other side, we have Frederik Persson from Gothenburg Energy, also an IRIS partner, who is interested in replicating some of these solutions and knowledge in Gothenburg. And he will have some questions to Robin and to us to guide us through this webinar. The process uh, of the realization of our world premiere of the AC vehicle to grid solution is based on open standards. And this will be explained in this presentation, including all the corporations that were held with different stakeholders. The focus will be on different vehicle to grid technologies, uh, the cooperation with Renault, and other partners and the strategy for scale up of vehicle to grid solutions in the near future. Finally, uh, the information uh, will be shared on this year's rollout of vehicle to grid infrastructures uh, as Utrecht is becoming the first city in the world with a city-wide network of vehicle to grid chargers and the biggest vehicle to grid charging place being built as we speak right now. Um, we will have a short program that I will try to put uh, online here. Yes, so here you see our uh, faces on the right hand side. And as you, as you noticed, um, you see some mm, short overview of our presentation. Uh, to all uh, people attending, please mute your microphone. Uh, this will improve the recording and our webinar. As I said, we will start with a short presentation of uh, Frederik Persson of Gothenburg Energy. Frederick will share some of the questions that the city of Gothenburg and Gothenburg Energy have and why they would like to exchange knowledge on AC vehicle to grid solutions with Utrecht. After that, we have Robin Berg here from Lomboxnet who takes over and shows uh, what challenges are being faced when trying to introduce this new technology in an existing energy market and how this amazing innovation of AC vehicle to grid solutions is uh, becoming reality. During the presentation, you can ask your questions, as I mentioned before, use the chat box or uh, unmute yourself and make yourself uh, known. We will address the, these questions directly. And after the presentation, we will have a bit longer time to, uh, yeah, to go into a more deeper discussion. So that will be around uh, 10 of 20 to 2 uh, till 3 o'clock. Um, this webinar will last a little bit more than an hour and we will make a recording. Uh, please keep your microphone there for minutes uh, to avoid background noises. Um, yeah, and we will have we have an additional 25 minutes of in-depth discussion after three o'clock for uh, a small group that is interested to further discuss uh, where we can take a, a bit more in-depth discussion as well. So for now, um, I uh, will introduce the first speaker. I'm very happy to have Frederik Persson from Gothenburg Energy on board. Um, Frederik is uh, 46 old from Vesteras in Sweden and is a development engineer project manager at Gothenburg Energy. Uh, and Frederik has worked since 2002 with renewable energy, including district heating, biogas, wind power and smart grids. And um, I will ask Frederick to start this presentation right now. Frederick, okay. are you ready? Yes, thank you so much. Right. Uh, um, first of all, I'd like to, to thank you for, for us to be uh, able to present ourselves for, for you. Uh, in this room, we have uh, six participants from Gothenburg Energy. 
uh, mostly working with uh, charging uh, solutions or R&D issues here at Cuttenberry Energy. Uh, I'd like to clarify a little bit. We don't have any solutions for vehicle to grid in Gothenburg Energy or any decisions to, to do that, but we uh, are very keen on following the, uh, the information regarding that subject. So, so that's, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, I, will, I will present a little bit what we have been doing in Gothenburg for the last uh, eight year, 10 years or so. Uh, we started at, in 2008 with some uh, projects, uh, just a small group from us, but there were a lot of collaboration with other companies here in Gothenburg, uh, Volvo Cars and Ericsson, for example, uh, connecting cars and the, and the grid solutions. So, and it was quite early on, so, so we, we, uh, we didn't uh, manage to, to do anything about it, but it was an R&D project that we learned some things from. Uh, 2011, we had some uh, uh, customers uh, that had some uh, very simple poles uh, for charging, uh, but they were uh, an actual customer that, that was very important for us. Um, in around there, uh, that area, we had some um, cars from from Volvo C30, uh, ten of them, and it was the first uh, pure electric cars from Volvo that was produced, and we had them in the company for for to use them and see see how to use an electric car. So that was also very important for us to, to learn more about um, electric cars and, and so on and what, what to do with them. Uh, we have education for, for our um, uh, employees, for example, in that period of time. And then uh, around uh, 2013, we started with uh, bus projects and, and charging buses in, uh, in traffic also. So we had uh, three buses uh, in a route in, in, through Gothenburg. I was charging and some follow-up projects on that for electricity, for example, that's been very successful for Volvo buses. And we have been managing the charging stations in, in these projects. And then uh, the latest years, there's been a lot of um, uh, development regarding the charging for rapid charging and uh, more public charging for, for uh, end customers. And we of course, we have noticed a little, a, a large uh, number of increased large of interest for, for public charging and so on. Uh, and then also we have um, uh, developed our products uh, towards the companies and uh, uh, and so on. So we are and these. It's more like a, um, a real product for us now. It's not not just uh, r and ds it's more more physical product that we are selling so that's a very quick presentation of of the history that we have um, been able to do here the last 10 years so our um focus now in this project will be the the question and we have we have put up some questions and, and I, I would say that this is a very new area for us with a vehicle to grid so, so we have a lot of um, questions that we would like the, the project maybe can can answer when when it's done. And so that's uh, we hope and we hope that these questions can help you to 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 find some answers on them. And I, I won't go through all of them. I, I just have five minutes, so so I won't be able to do that. But uh, we have some general and technical solutions, control questions, and business models. And um, yeah, I, I won't I won't read them. You can do that by yourself. But that, that's uh, we, we do have a lot of questions regarding this, and we, we would be very happy if you can have have some answers for them in your project. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, thank you. This is my name is Ru, and I thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think uh, these are very interesting questions, and uh, I think some of them will be uh, already addressed by Robin. During, during this presentation, this presentation. And, and others. others. Uh, oh, and, and others will follow, follow shortly. shortly. I will now give, give the, the, the to, uh, to, uh, to Robin. Robin. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Very much. Uh, let me share my screen here. 
Okay. Yeah, is that looking good? Okay, perfect. Um, yes, well, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, good to see uh, a lot of people uh, in the webinar at this time. Um, I will do a short presentation about the project we're doing with the different partners um, and also uh, look into uh, the, the questions you've got. And please don't hesitate to uh, to ask me anything uh, during the, the, the presentation because then uh, we can uh, go in uh, a, a bit deeper if necessary. Um, just just, just to, to quickly start off, um, the, let me see, yeah, there it is. The, the project uh, uh, was originated from my company Lomboxnet, which, which originally is a, a fiber internet provider in the Lombok area in Utrecht uh, and that's also where the name uh, comes from. Um, and um, th this is also why this, uh, uh, where the first funding of this project came from. Um, because basically what we did was we used the income from the fiber network to uh, start to roll out uh, our own network of uh, solar panels on the 25 uh, school roofs in uh, Utrecht uh, and the surrounding cities. Um, we first started with a few schools and now we have uh, like 8,000 panels um, on 25 roofs um, and we are the owner of those installations as a company. Um, so you can understand that um, we were always looking for ways to improve uh, the business case of those installations. Uh, just to give you a brief idea what kind of installations we have here, it's mostly uh, primary and uh, secondary schools. Um, all over the region um, and uh, we are still developing new schools. Uh, last month we did another school with 500 solar panels. Um, and from this project we started uh, uh, in Lombok, uh, the smart solar charging pro project and it basically started with the rollout of our own uh, private grid right next to our fiber network. It was a small one but what we basically did was connected uh, two of the schools to our office building, which is the Y building in this picture, um, and connect the uh, solar panels directly to our installation. Um, and the reason why we did this, because then we would be able to see how we could optimize the usage of uh, solar energy. Um, and the first thing really we did was install uh, the first bi-directional charging station in Europe. And this was a part of a, a local uh, uh, program together with the province of Utrecht and the city of Utrecht. And we cooperated with uh, Nissan Europe uh, to install this system. Um, and basically what we did was um, this technology was um, coming from Japan um, because in Japan there was regulation uh, in place after the Fukushima disaster and all the nuclear power plants being shut down that all electric cars is, have to be able to do bi-directional charging um, to help um, with blackouts. So um, basically what we did was uh, contact Nissan Europe and ask if we could get a system like that in Europe um, and then not for blackout purposes um, and backup purposes but for storing renewable energy um, and they said yes so this was the first installation in Europe and basically what we can now do with this installation is run our operations on our own solar energy for 24 hours a day so during the day uh, the car is being charged and during the night is being discharged and our office and internet company is now fully running on our own solar power so this was like uh, five, six years ago already um, and was really a first test to see what you can do with bi-directional technology in, uh, in the Netherlands and in Europe. Um, and the first thing we really notice is that you see a big cabinet, it's quite expensive and it only works with Japanese cars. So um, we were of course looking for uh, options to scale up um, and also for ways to really look in the future of cars because 
The Nissan Leaf, the first that was in the picture, only has a range of 100 kilometers, while we are really looking for the cars that have a range of like 500 kilometers, like this one. This was my vacation address three years ago already in the north of Norway, uh, really nice. And you can get there by, by this car. Um, but the funny thing is, um, for your daily commute, you in the Netherlands, for example, you only use like 75 kilometers. That's like a quarter or even less than, uh, of the, the, the this battery can do. So for your daily usage of an electric car, you basically only need one quarter of the battery. And that means that three quarters of the battery is not being used at all. Um, and to give you an idea, three quarters of the battery of this car can power your house for more than a week. So this is quite a lot of battery storage just sitting there in front of your house or in your street doing nothing. And that's really where the bidirectional concept, uh, uh, we think, has a really big opportunity and why we looked into ways to uh, develop this any further. Um, so with this project, also the grid operator came into place um, and they were really interested. Uh, Staden is the local grid operator in the, the region of Utrecht to integrate this system also in their network. Um, and I won't go into detail in this uh, uh, scheme, but what you see is a few OCPP, OCPI um, terms, and these are really important open standards in charging infrastructure, uh, mostly developed in the Netherlands, but now also internationally um, um, taking over. OCPP, for example, is now a, a European standard, and OCPI is also fastly becoming a European standard in charging. And um, I mentioned them here, and I will come back to them later, because for us, this is a really important uh, thing to look into. So with this uh, concept, we really looked into ways okay, when you have one charging station, it's interesting, but um, you, you can power the office of our company, but how much would you need to do a whole neighborhood? So this is an animation made by the Dutch television of our neighborhood Lombok. Um, and together with the University of Utrecht, we calculated that you basically only need like 200 full electric cars. And of course, a lot of solar on the roofs of all the houses to do the same thing on neighborhood level as we are doing with our office building. And to give you an idea, 200 cars, that's only 10% of the public parking spaces in this neighborhood. So with 10% fully electric cars, you could basically run the whole neighborhood on your own solar energy. And of course, during the winter, you will also need some renewables from other sources outside this neighborhood. But just to give you an idea with uh, how much amount of cars you would need to get this uh, organized. And for the whole city, um, basically, you only need uh, eight and a half thousand cars. And there are more than 100,000 cars in the city of Utrecht. So this is, we think, really an interesting uh, concept. And that's why we really looked into ways how to scale this up. Um, and what really helped in that was that the region of Utrecht um, said, OK, this is interesting. We want to help um, and make sure that this concept, which has been developed in the Lombok area, is part of the regional energy strategy for the whole region. And an ambition scale-up plan came into place in which um, they really supported us to getting this to a next level. And this support from the local governments um, uh, really helped, um, for example, um, in uh, the next step we made. Um, because three years ago, um, we signed a deal with Renault um, and uh, you see here on this picture, um, next to the king and queen, um, in the middle, you see uh, Jeroen Krijkamp. He is a former alderman of the Utrecht city. He was there on behalf of the Utrecht region, shaking hands with one of the top action, uh, uh, top guys uh, at Renault, um, being uh, responsible for electric mobility. And the deal we made there really consisted about two things, getting the technology uh, available for large-scale implementation and getting a program ready for large-scale implementation. And I will go deeply, more deep into both uh, uh, goals. Um, so the first thing we, we did was really look into what Renault was offering and how can we develop bi-directional charging 
for standard scale-up purposes. Um, the unique thing about uh, the Renault uh, cars is that they fully support 22 kilowatts AC charging. Uh, most cars don't go up to uh, 11. Um, and uh, only Tesla also uh, provides higher uh, charging uh, connection on AC. Um, but Renault is really strong in supporting 22 kilowatts AC charging. Um, and for us, this is very interesting because if you want to do uh, smart things with the energy system, the more power you can get into a car or get out of a car is, of course, uh, more interesting because when power is cheap, you can get more power into the car. And uh, at the other way around, when the prices are high and you have bidirectional technology available, you can get more power out of a car and make more money. It's just that simple. Um, so the first thing we defined is that we would use an open protocol for this bidirectional charging. Um, and this is the ISO 15118 uh, protocol, which is also being used in Shademo um, bidirectional charging. Um, is also being used in CCS, uh, fast charging, for example, for plug and charge, where you don't need your charge card anymore and the, the, the car is being automatically um, authorized by the charging station using 1511.8 uh, communication. And basically what we did was develop the technology so that both the car and the charging station can talk this protocol, which is already being supported by the automotive industry. Um, and this took us quite some time. Um, uh, two years we have been going to Paris a lot in the Techno Center with our charging station and with the first beta prototypes from Renault. Uh, testing and testing and making sure that the, we both implemented this protocol in the same way, use the same kind of uh, uh, programming language, same kind of implementation um, of this, this ISO 15118 and making sure that the technology works. Um, and after that, um, in the beginning of this year, um, we got it ready and Renault provided us with the first cars in the world that are able to do AC bidirectional charging based on this 1511.8 standard. And we had the first uh, charging station available. Um, and this was reason for the Dutch King to come to Utrecht um, and open uh, this installation and um, the official inauguration of this. Um, and this of course is very, nice to have a king and uh, top level people from Renault coming to Utrecht uh, and of course um, a lot of interest from both media and people coming to this event um, but this was not um, of course our primary interest our primary interest was really to kick off an open standard and break open uh, this new technology and uh, in the future make it available for everyone um, and by doing that and really introducing um, the first charging station that is now available in the market that support this technology. Um, by the way, it has been developed uh, together with Dutch partners, Sears uh, and Last Mile Solutions. And with strong support from ALAT, which is a corporate Dutch corporation of all the Dutch grid operators on electric mobility. And of course, uh, Group Renault. Um, we have now the first station in the market. Um, and we hope other parties will follow uh, soon. Um, and with having the station in the market and the standard being available for the market, um, you can now really see uh, the market showing interest. Um, because when you have an open protocol for AC charging, which is already supported by all car manufacturers and all charging station manufacturers, I mean, AC is on every European electric car. Uh, we think bidirectional charging is now also uh, getting ready for scale up. Um, and you see this, uh, for example, in interest of other car manufacturers. We are now in talks with uh, five uh, car manufacturers showing interest. And that is big ones um, from different countries, but also uh, small ones like Sona Motors, we, which you see the picture. Um, Sona Motors is uh, uh, developing a solar car. It will come to market next year, being produced by uh, the, the Swedish uh, 
car factory um, from NEFS, uh, the old SAP factory. Um, they will start production next year with 10,000 units a year. And all these cars will support AC bi-directional charging based on 1511 night protocol. Um, so as you can imagine, we are in close contact now with them to make sure that they will do the same kind of implementation of AC 11 8 as we know, so that their cars will work at the same implementation of the protocol. Um, so the standard is being uh, adopted uh, everywhere at the same uh, the same manner. Um, so this is of course a very interesting development because with this more car companies will come to market with cars supporting this technology. Um, and uh, Renault has said that they will um, start mass production of this, this technology uh, at the end of 2020 and cars will be available in the first half of 2021. So that's in uh, a bit more than a year uh, from Renault itself. So, um, and we are also in talks with other car manufacturers, which uh, are uh, not public talks. So I, I can't mention very much about it because we leave that up to the car makers themselves, of course. Um, but we are seeing interest from all sides. So that's, that's really uh, uh, good to see. Um, another result of having a standard in place is that now cities and other people that roll out charging infrastructure can now put this ISO 15118 for AC in their tenders. Um, and you won't be surprised that Utrecht, the city of Utrecht was the first city who did that last year um, already. And they said, okay, we want to have all the charging stations that are being installed from now on in the city to support AC 15118 both for bi-directional charging and for plug and charge. So charging without a charging card. Um, so we got the assignment for that and we are now installing the first 150 charging stations as we speak all over the city. And with that, uh, the city of Utrecht is the, uh, indeed the first city in the world with a city wide network of bi-directional public charging stations. And the next standard that will start next year will be an uh, assignment for 2,000 charging stations. Um, and they also all will have to be bi-directional. So Utrecht is really aiming quite high and they basically want to become the first city in the world being able to run on bi-directional power like we are doing today with our office and with our neighborhood in Lombok, but then on a city scale. So this is quite a, an ambition, but Utrecht is really quite serious with it and I think um, other cities, at least in the Netherlands, but also internationally, uh, are following this example um, quite rapidly, actually. Um, to give you an idea how this looks like, um, these are recent uh, installations we did all over the city. Um, and of course, most cars will just be charging there because almost all cars in the market right now on the road, they don't support AC bidirectional charging. Um, so this is just being rolled out as a standard charging infrastructure for people living, working and visiting Utrecht city. Um, but every charging station you see on this picture is fully ready to support bidirectional charging. So the blue car you see in the left corner, uh, that's one of the prototypes we got from Renault. We run with this car all over the city, testing bidirectional charging all over the, all over town. So um, it's already working um, and the hardware and the software is, uh, is ready for scale up. Um, and another uh, an interesting project already mentioned by Rule is that at this point, um, together with Triodos Bank, we are building the largest bidirectional charging plaza in the world. It's close to Utrecht. So, uh, Triodos Bank is building a new head office that will be ready in, uh, in, in one month. And right next to this office, um, they are installing um, a, a solar roof, which you see on this picture with uh, almost 2,000 uh, solar panels, 3,000 square meters of solar. And beneath that, they, uh, we, we are right now um, installing and uh, powering up, that will happen this week, um, 120 bidirectional charging stations. Um, so Teodos Bank is really getting ready to use this installation with bi-directional cars, which are coming in the coming years to really have 
a huge battery backup to to charge with solar and use the, the car batteries for when there's no solar available to power their complete new office building. So this is a real practical example how you can use bidirectional charging in more like an office kind of uh, setup, but also at the same time helping the grid operator in making sure that when the sun is shining, not all of the power is going back into the grid on a sunny Sunday afternoon when the office is closed. So this is really um, the use cases we're looking at. It's, it's really large scale implementations at one side, but also small scale, uh, but larger numbers on the whole city uh, level. And we think these kinds of uh, implementations of bidirectional charging are really the way to go into, into the future. So that's really what we are doing with the technology um, and um, really getting ready for uh, national uh, and also international rollout of this, uh, this technology. The Dutch government is very supportive in, in this. Um, just a few weeks ago, they uh, sent out a press release that they will make available 5 million euros for a national rollout in 21 Dutch uh, cities. Um, 40, 72 of uh, uh, bidirectional charging stations will be installed, of which most of which will be AC. Uh, there will also be a bit of DC, uh, but most of them will be AC bidirectional. Um, so that is really uh, the part of, about uh, task one we got from the deal with Renault. Um, and the second one was really to look for a way how to implement this technology in a city like Utrecht. Um, and that's where the We Drive Solar car sharing comes in. Um, we developed a car sharing program which really focused at replacing your own car. So it's really focused at people that use their car quite often, but not that often that they that there's a real good business case for having your own or your second car. So this is really at replacing people that are not using their cars or their second car on a on daily basis. Um, we have now 70 cars in operation, mostly in the region, but also cars in Zoetermeer and Amsterdam. Um, and uh, for example, uh, the cars are being used uh, at uh, Utrecht Science Park by the uh, Hogeschool Utrecht and University of Utrecht um, as a, a, a pool car for their employees. Um, and what is very interesting that we have a strong interest um, from uh, project developers um, needing uh, smarter solutions with their new housing projects. And this video you see um, uh, made uh, at a small project in Utrecht is with Sinterzeg Mea, which is the largest real estate developer in the Netherlands. Uh, they have like billions of euros uh, pension funds invested uh, in all kinds of housing projects. And they are really looking into ways how to be able to have less parking space and more smart mobility. Um, and together with them, we are doing several projects now in Utrecht, um, replacing parking spaces by shared vehicles. And this is really very interesting because we really developed a concept in how you can offer mobility with a house. So all people that started living here, uh, they get a free uh, access to these cars as a get to know uh, subscription. And if they wanna drive more, of course they have to pay. Um, and this works really very well because in this specific project at the Lange Nieuwstraat, which are mostly starters, um, more than 50% of the people living there are using this system, are using our offering. And by doing that, this is not no longer uh, a small niche project, but really uh, a mainstream project for people living in a city like Utrecht. And when you have a concept like this in Utrecht, um, yeah, you're living in the, the best city because Utrecht at this moment is the, the, the fastest growing city in the Netherlands. More than 50 to 60,000 new households, houses will be built in the coming 10 to 15 years, most of them within the city. Um, so a lot of new houses coming into the city with no more car infrastructure being added. So more and more bicycle paths will be added, but no more roads. Um, so we are working now with a lot of projects to really uh, go from uh, car ownership to shared mobility systems. 
Um, this is one at the east side of Utrecht, um, a small scale project. We're involved with uh, a larger project in the, the central station district. Um, uh, another project uh, uh, together with uh, Synchroon is a project we are doing also uh, close to the city center. 1500 new houses are being built and we are providing mobility services um, and replacing uh, the, the parking spaces. Uh, a large project also being developed by uh, Sintes of Mea is the MART project. It's right uh, at uh, the Leidserijn uh, Center uh, station, a uh, whole new city district which is being developed as we speak. And uh, Sintes of Mea will develop 1,100 houses there. Um, and for their rent, uh, the people who live there, there will be no parking spaces. Um, so there will be 100 shared cars and if needed more, uh, but there will be no more parking spaces. Um, and the solar energy will come from the red building you see in the front of the picture that will be covered with solar. It's a parking area it's, which already exists on the roof of a, a, a big mall and it will provide all the solar energy needed for this project and our cars will be charged with this solar. Um, and the last project I want to show you, it's, it's really uh, one of the largest building tenders uh, of uh, last year. It was won by MRP and Ballas Nedum. Um, it's right north of the Lombok area, actually, right close to uh, where we are. Uh, a complete new neighborhood will be built there with almost 3,000 houses. Um, and we will provide the mobility for those houses because together with the city, we aim for a parking norm lower than 0 0.3. So most people living here won't have a car anymore. Um, and if they need a car, they can use the two to 300 cars and e-bikes we will be uh, offering there. Um, and this will become their main form of car mobility. So the car uh, ownership here will be, go, will be gone to almost zero. This is quite a, uh, a new approach for uh, this, such a project, but uh, together with the city and the, the, these developers, we think we can do this. And when you look at the same project from the south side, you understand where AC bidirectional charging comes in, because this is all solar, you see. There will be a, a sound wall um, between the housing area and the, the, the railway tracks, five meters high, covered with solar. And of course, most buildings will be covered with solar as well. So there will be a lot of local solar energy production in this area. Um, and um, our cars will be used storing this energy when there's a peak and giving back this energy when there's a peak in the month and not that much solar available. And these kinds of solutions are really necessary because in the surrounding areas, the same kind of projects are being developed. At the north side, the other project with Synchron is being developed. At the east side, also new housing projects are being developed. And at the, the, the south side, the Lombok area is already in place, installing a lot of solar as we speak. So the solar energy cannot go anywhere else. So these, um, without um, putting enormous cables to neighborhoods like this, uh, we think uh, you need local solutions like bidirectional charging to solve these kind of issues and keep the grid um, uh, not only uh, in the air and, and, and running, but also uh, affordable um, for everyone in the future. Um, uh, and this is not only Utrecht uh, with these kinds of projects. We signed a deal with uh, seven cities and uh, two Dutch uh, ministries and uh, a lot of uh, project developers to help other projects all over the country to learn from the things we're doing in Utrecht and um, not build huge parking spaces anymore, but use smart solutions like these and really also connect the solar with the charging stations and, and, and the cars. Um, so um, just to end my presentation, um, we think this technology will be uh, 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 big in the future. Um, Renault is really betting quite high on this technology um, and uh, 
presenting their future now all over the world. Uh, we see international interest, not just from car makers, but also from grid operators all over Europe and also internationally coming to Utrecht and visiting us and wanting to know more. Um, for example, Enedis, but also um, and, and, and Italian uh, grid operators showing huge amount of interest and of course being in talk with Renault and other car manufacturers to come up with solutions like this on the short term um, because solar is growing rapidly everywhere, <laughs> not just here. The Netherlands is in fact quite behind. Um, and um, it's not just um, the, the bi-directional but it also is like the, the, the electric, electrification of mobility. Um, I was one of the lucky guys to be present at the, the launch of the Tesla Model 3 already more than three years ago. And the first Dutch guy who actually got a ride in this car. Um, and then of course we had to have some patience, but um, in Norway and in Switzerland and in the Netherlands, um, this is now the current situation that the Tesla Model 3 is, is, is the best-selling electric car of all cars. So it's, uh, it's, it's uh, flooding our country as we speak. <laughs> um, and uh, Tesla has also been announcing that they are really serious looking into bi-directional technology. Maybe not in the near future, but maybe like in two, three years. Um, and uh, so we expect also development from their side. Um, and we are ready for it. We, we are doing this with a lot of partners in the uh, Irish project, um, also in other projects, to really be ready for a large scale scale up. Scale up. Um, working together with grid operators, car companies, leasing companies, financing companies, uh, project developers, etc. Um, and um, really aiming at a, a launch of uh, this technology and uh, this system. And that was basically the, the, the story I wanted to tell you. Um, so please uh, feel free if you want to have any discussions, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm speaking here through the microphone of, uh, of Robin. Uh, we decided to use uh, this station now as the central hub for our discussions. Um, well, Robin, uh, first of all, I. Uh, Thank you a lot for this uh, inspiring presentation. Uh, I think it was a, a very nice introduction into many, many aspects uh, of this uh, truly yeah, integrative solution. And I think we, as the IRIS Consortium, I think all our partners, we are very proud to, uh, to have you also on board and that we, as the project, can also support this development. Because when I talk integrative, it's about electric vehicles, it's about the integration into the energy system, but also into urban development projects, uh, sustain more sustainable mobility systems. So in that sense, it's a truly yeah, inspiring solution for the IRIS Smart Cities project. Um, we have some questions uh, uh, received and um, Maybe before I will go into uh, the questions raised during the chat, I will give uh, Frederick also a first opportunity to respond on this presentation. Did it somehow address some of the questions that you had beforehand? And do you have any uh, immediate question that you would like to ask to Robin based on this? You uh, can yeah, unmute think, your microphone. Yes, I think we had uh, a lot of uh, answers. Uh, and it's very interesting to see this uh, technology being in such a, um, such a big scale uh, and tested in, in Utrecht. Uh, we, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit, in, um, the, uh, uh, talk a little bit about the, the commercial part of this. Uh, do you have, uh, uh, I think you have a lot of business uh, um, uh, different kind of opportunities to make uh, uh, new kinds of business in this uh, this with this technology. Uh, have, have you talked a little bit about that in the project? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, we are working closely together with um, energy market specialists. So, so to say, so both uh, energy suppliers, and of course, the, the grid operators to really look where the business case for short term and long term uh, is. Um, we have also uh, part of the project is also that we installed uh, and will be installing 
uh, a new one, a stationary uh, battery, to really learn how a battery can make money in the energy system today and where the future markets are. Yeah. Um, and that there are, of course, different markets available, like primary reserve, secondary reserve from Tenet and the large scale uh, grid operators. Um, but in the future, we think that also the business case will be in energy markets um, just by putting energy in the car when, the, when the, the power is cheap and getting it back out again when the power is expensive. Um, and we are just doing small scale tests on that and learning there. Um, and this, today, you can basically in the Netherlands only make money with the uh, primary reserve. So what we are doing is we're really adding cars to the stationary battery we already have yeah. and testing on them. Um, and, but in the end, we want to really support more and more markets um, to, to enhance the bit ticket. Yeah, it's very interesting to see that you add the pool, pool the charging, uh, sharing of cars in, in the equation. So I think that's uh, yeah. widened the, the car share. Yeah, from, from, the thing is from the car share operator, um, it's really about making money when cars are standing still. So, yeah. so of course we are making money when the cars are driving, and we want them to drive as much as possible. And in fact, yesterday they were almost all on the road. <laughs> so that for us, of course, they're very good. Um, but of course, even with shared cars, they're still for most time of the day. Yeah. Um, and we want them to make money when they are doing that. Yep. All right. Thank yeah, you. Thank uh, you very much. I will. Uh, I would like to go. Maybe we can follow up on those questions uh, uh, after we've uh, discussed some of the questions coming from uh, uh, some of the participants. Yeah. Uh, the first question uh, raised by Jim Hunt: uh, When do you suppose Tesla will support vehicle to grid? I think you answered that question at the end of your presentation uh, slightly, but maybe you can add something yeah. to that as well. Yeah. Well, Tesla, for example, but also with BYD. Um, the, the, the Chinese car maker, we are in good contact with both, but with these companies, you see that they have their priority focused on growing. Um, so they are really growing so fast that they are saying, okay, we are interested, but not today. Um, but the writings are on the wall. I mean, the first AC bidirectional car was built by BYD, which is almost one of the biggest car makers in the world, of course, for the Chinese market, but they are huge. Um, and the same was with Tesla, because uh, the first Tesla the Roadster was capable of doing AC bidirectional charging. Um, last year, Elon Musk tweeted that he's still very interested in bidirectional charging. And last week, the head of the uh, battery development unit at Tesla um, showed some more information about the new battery technology that will be releasing probably already next year in their cars, maybe a year later, because that's probably in Elon Musk time. Um, but uh, he was explicitly naming bidirectional charging because the cars they are, the batteries they are developing now, they are um, specif specifically aimed at supporting one miles of um, usage. So they, the batteries can do a lot of cycles. So they are ready for heavy traffic, um, uh, have heavy duty, uh, trucking, so professional usage, robo taxis that drive every day, all day. And the third point he, he mentioned specifically is bidirectional technology. So these batteries are capable of doing so many cycles that Tesla will probably support bidirectional charging with those batteries at, in place. So, of course, with Tesla, you never know, but I think it can come sooner than we think, especially with the standards now being in place. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Robin, and uh, good to see uh, your view on uh, the future that will become vehicle to grid. Um, I just go through the second question from Harald uh, Bauma. Uh, maybe you can read. Well, the, you can read the question and respond yeah. on that. Uh, the, the, the safety on the grid. Um, this, of course, is a very important issue, and this was also the thing that took us the longest time in developing this technology together with Renault, um, because when you have a a car charging back on the grid on AC, it's basically 
charging directly on the grid. There's no more DC station in between. So you really need to have safety measures in the charging station and the car. And Renault, of course, when something will go wrong, everyone will look at the car because that is the device giving power back to the grid. So they have taken this quite seriously and basically looked at the same uh, grid codes and regulations that are applicable for solar installations. So when solar is providing power back at your home or whatever, wherever, and the grid falls off, the uh, inverter has to stop automatically. And so the inverter in the car that's already there today, uni unidirectional, uh, when it becomes bidirectional, it will have to stop automatically. Um, so if you, we sometimes, we get a lot of questions that if, if cars that are on the road today can do bidirectional charging with AC, and the answer is no, because the onboard charger, and that was also one of the, the other questions I saw, the onboard charger in the car has to be fully supportive for AC bidirectional. And that's uh, a hardware thing and a software thing. So it is a specifically new thing in the car. Um, and, and the cars that are on the road today provided by Renault, there are only 15 of them today and different projects in Europe. We got the first ones, but there are more today um, uh, already on the road in different projects. They have a special made onboard charger that is capable of doing that. And um, the production version will have especially made production onboard AC bidirectional charging on board. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, this is not something you can easily do on a car. It really is a, uh, a thing that will be done uh, specifically. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robin. And uh, I'm really sorry, 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 back. sorry. Jim, Jim Hunt here. If I can just interject, this is my speciality. Um, uh, I, I sit on ISO 15118 committees, and as, as luck would have it, um, I, I, I was talking about LinkedIn earlier. I'll, I'll dig out the link and put it in the chat. But uh, Mark Moulton, who's uh, very active in the 15118 committee, has just put up a uh, sort of FAQ on this precise issue. So I will dig out the link and pop it in the chat, if that's OK. Sorry to interrupt. No, yep. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you for your uh, interruption and, and additional inputs. And also to Harald, if you have any questions, uh, we can after three o'clock also follow up on to this discussion uh, in a bit more detail if yep. uh, if requested. And, uh, yeah, we, we, we can still need all the support also in these committees because Renault is really um, looking for support um, because when they first put this on the agenda in the committees, all the other car makers said AC bidirectional charging does not exist and will not exist. Um, so they had quite some challenges to really prove that it uh, it does exist actually, and it's already working uh, today. But um, the German car makers, for example, they were very anxious in not having it on the table at first. Um, more and more support is, is, is there now, but we can still use all the support uh, in the future because uh, um, we also want to have the other car makers on board. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going back to the uh, second question of, um, I think it related to the, uh, now if you can go back one, one more. more. Yes, from Arthur Andrus Kiewicz. Yeah, the, of course we provide a smart charging um could you repeat the question yeah. maybe for people who don't agree uh, the, the question is does we drive solar also provide smart charging a way to control the charge and discharge of the car in a function of any input uh, yes we do uh, we have already in place uh, of course uh, solar powered control so when there's more solar the power to the car goes up and the other way around um, at this point we are working on uh, apx so basically energy prices real time smart charging control so when prices go up we uh, bring the power down and when prices go down we bring the power up again um, so we are looking and of course we are always um, um, protecting the the local grid connection so 
when more cars are plugging in than the grid connection can handle we of course balance uh, the power to the different cars to be able to uh, not have a, a failure on the grid connection um yeah next question yeah next question jasper <laughs> uh, from jasper uh, what are the costs of the bidirectional charging station um well they are uh, we, we at first we really aimed at uh, developing a charging station uh, for public space and uh, uh, a station that we are now also using uh, at the triodos project for example and at the utah science park which we are now also rolling out uh, charging stations um and basically it's in the same price as charging stations that have the same um, specs. So it's it's a high-end charging station um, and it's around 3,000 euros um, and it's capable of doing two times 22 kilowatts at, at, at both outlets at the same time. Um, so th that's basically what a high-end charging station would cost normally. Um, and the bi-directional is maybe only 50 U to 100 euros extra compared to uh, a charging station uh, produced by one one of our uh, colleagues. Yeah. All right, thank you, uh, Robin. Can, Barna, can, can we I, go to the next slide? Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. basically, a normal uh, double uh, charging pole is around seventeen hundred euros, seventeen fifteen or something like that. How did you convince the uh, the uh, municipality of Utrecht that they need twice as much to pay for the next uh, 2,000 uh, uh, charging poles they will uh, install? Well, to be honest, a charging station which you put in the street in Utrecht is not 1,700 euros. Um, because there's also a grid connection inside. Um, yeah, so okay. When we call all that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so... Yeah. And, and, of course, you can get a charging station for 1700 euros, no problem. We can get them as well. Um, but they don't, um, are not, are not uh, fit for the specs of the city of Utrecht. Um, but to answer your question, we are doing the investment in the charging station in Utrecht. We are uh, the, the, the risk, uh, we are the owner of those charging stations, so we have to make the money to earn our investment. Um, and that's uh, Still not uh, a done deal, but we will do our best to do so. Um, but yeah, the the prices we get from our competition, which are on the same uh, specs as our our stations, uh, basically uh, we see that our stations is maybe like ten percent more expensive, but mostly less. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. And, and if we, we can continue this discussion also after three o'clock uh, in a bit more detail, if required. I want to go to a question from John C. on the Mechano project. Um, yeah, Robin, maybe if you could read the question and, and then respond with your, uh, your thoughts, the first one. Yeah. Um, yeah, people are off to work with the EV. You still need the grid to store the energy of Powerwall. Uh, the concept is a good idea, and production has to be there where the car and most of the time. Uh, yeah, well, the funny thing is that um, when you look at our uh, car sharing, uh, sharing scheme, um, of course, our cars are being used most during daytime. Um, and uh, But there are always still cars available because what you have to understand is when you live in a project like uh, Cartesius Driuk, which uh, is, is this question is referring to, um, you are not using this car anymore for your commute. You are doing your commute by train or by bike. That that's becoming rapidly the main form of transport in the city of Utrecht for people doing their commute. So of course you will use this car, but not uh, from nine to five. Um, so the number of cars being available during the day is still quite a lot and we see that in our uh, numbers so when you have like two to three to maybe even 400 shared vehicles in a project like that there will be always at least 50 to 100 cars available um, and as i open my presentations 50 to 100 cars that's a lot of power you can put into those uh, batteries um, and a lot of storage available at an, a neighborhood level. I mean, you only need like 200 cars to do the whole neighborhood of Lombok. You need 
the same amount of, and, and then I mean like 24 hours. Um, so we really look at this a lot. And of course we look at the reservation data we get from um, the car sharing program. And that is really showing a lot of potential because when you connect basically the reservation uh, algorithms to the energy system, you, you already know how much battery you have uh, available the next day. Um, and of course, stationary storage will also be part of the deal and there will be some stationary storage as well available. Uh, but you don't need huge amount of stationary storage. The huge amounts will come from the cars and sometimes you need a little bit of stationary storage. When um, uh, at peak times, there's so much solar power available or uh, uh, suddenly a lot of cars are gone. But that will only be needed in extreme situations. Um, next question, um, how will this be implemented for the end user, the driver of a private car and person hiring a shared car? What minimum stage of charge can they expect? Is there a financial advantage for the private driver? Um, yes, of course. Um, we are already developing with Jetlix, one of the partners also in the Utrecht projects, uh, an app um, that is giving control to a private owner of a bidirectional car to control uh, the minimum state of the battery. Uh, so when you have a car and you want to leave in the morning, you of course want to have, uh, uh, you want to be sure that the, the car is charged when you leave your house at a certain level. Um, so these, basically all these technologies are already available here today. Uh, it's only connecting them to make sure that they work well. Um, and I, we think this is the easy part. So getting the cars there and making sure that all car manufacturers follow the same route, that's where most of our time goes to. Um, and getting the systems in place, that's the easy part. So, yeah. Okay, and um, I will, uh, uh, I see there's a final question added to the chat screen. Um, I suggest we answer the last question and then we close the webinar, but can still continue for 20 more minutes or until half past uh, four, uh, half past three with some more detailed yeah. discussion. But yeah. maybe for now, finalize the, the last yes, question. Yes, a question by Johnny. Do you think there will be a time where I am paid to have my vehicle plugged in all day and allowing you to trade with the energy rather than paying to have it charged? Mm -hmm. um, well, that will depend on which country you live, because uh, at this point of time, the regulation in different countries is really, um, uh, well, uh, um, defining how much money there is to be made. Um, in the UK, for example, already today, there is money to be made uh, when you have a car plugged in uh, in a bidirectional situation, and OVO uh, Energy is already showing uh, the results of that. Um, but for example, in the Netherlands, you have to pay taxes when you store energy in your car. Um, that's not really a good regulation yet there. So we have to fix that first. Um, and at European level, you see different countries with different kind of bottom action regulation um, to make this technology really becoming available wide scale to every end consumer and making money out of it. But I think, um, when we go to more and more renewables in the system uh, and storage becoming more and more important, um, I think there is quite a, some interesting business case for owning a big battery um, and providing it to the grid. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, uh, Robin. And indeed, this is also one of the uh, objectives of the, uh, the Iris project, to test out these type of new business cases and to be ready for that future when we have more renewables to take into account. Um, for now, I thank uh, Roman a lot for the presentation, Frederick for uh, your questions. We will probably follow them up uh, shortly after. We've come to the end of the webinar. 